And good evening. Three weeks after that surprise search of Mar-a-Lago, the fight over what was found inside and how much can be made public only growing more complicated by the day. The Department of Justice tonight saying it has finished its review of material seized from the par property, determining just a limited set of items are protected by attorney-client privilege. But Trump, former President Trump calling in for a special master to review those documents once again to determine which files are off limits for the government's investigation. A Florida judge that was appointed by Trump signaling she would be open to such an appointment. And separately, the director of national intelligence launching a probe into the same set of documents to determine what damage, if any, was done to our national security while those boxes were improperly stored at Mar-a-Lago. Senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell leads us off tonight. Tonight, Guys, measuring the Mar-a-Lago search fallout. The director of national intelligence has ordered a damage report, an assessment of the potential risk to national security. Today, the White House distanced itself and said it did not request that review, and President Biden has received no information. I can say that he has not been briefed. Eleven sets of classified materials were seized, and another 184 classified documents were recovered earlier from the Trump residence, according to the Department of Justice, who today told the court they did find a limited set of what could be attorney-client privileged information seized by the FBI during the search. Protected documents the former president's lawyers cited when he sued the U.S. government asking a federal judge to name an independent party to review all material taken. The judge indicated she is likely to grant that special master. Today, the Department of Justice told the court that the initial sorting of documents has already been completed. But Mr. Trump's team pushed back. We have a lot of problems really accepting everything at face value that's coming out of DOJ these days. It's a very politicized place, I'm sad to say. When he was a candidate, Donald Trump pledged to protect official secrets. In my administration, I'm going to enforce all laws concerning the protection of classified information. But Trump ally Lindsey Graham suggests any charges could actually lead to violence. I'll say this. If there's a prosecution of Donald Trump for mishandling classified information, there'll be riots in the streets. Some tough talk from Senator Graham there. Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. Kelly, when could the judge weigh in on appointing that special master? Well, we think that could happen this week. Judge Aileen Cannon, who was appointed by President Trump, has set a hearing for Thursday, and she's also set a deadline for tomorrow for the Department of Justice to answer some questions. They provided some of that information, but we expect they will have more to say. And she'll give both sides a chance to argue, but she's already indicated she's inclined to allow for that extra set of eyes to review the documents. And she is a federal judge separate from the one who originally approved the affidavit. Uh, that's Judge Bruce Reinhardt. So there are two separate cases that are both unfolding in Florida. Tom? All right, Kelly O'Donnell from the White House for us. Kelly, we appreciate it. Uh, with President Trump's team still calling for an independent special master to review what was seized, how will the case proceed now that the DOJ has already reviewed those documents? NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now on set. So, Danny, we heard Kelly report there. It sounds like the judge is leaning towards the special master, but the FBI just went through the documents and said, listen, this is the attorney-client privilege ones. Do you think the special master still happens? I do, mostly because it is the safe choice. A judge later on will insulate herself from criticism by saying, look, they wanted a special master in an abundance of caution. I've appointed one. Now, at this point, the toothpaste may be out of the tube. There may be no way, really, for the special master to do anything about preventing DOJ from looking at attorney-client privileged documents. So, to some degree, the fact that the Trump team waited so long to even ask for the appointment of a special master is going to make their argument a little weaker in seeking to have one appointed. You said something really interesting right now. You always do, but you said something that I picked up on. The toothpaste the out judge, of the tube? No, the judge is aware of criticism. Do you think some of the decisions being made here are, are being made because the judges in these cases are aware that the entire country is watching? They want to make sure that they are bulletproof? Because you would think the judge would just be following the letter of the law, but is there something else also influencing the decisions here? We designed our federal judges, the framers did, to be insulated from outside influence. 
It's laughable to think that that is uh, possible to do completely today with the level of scrutiny that a federal judge or any judge gets when they're deciding cases of this kind of import. And keep in mind, this is a federal judge who probably thought she was going to be nowhere near this controversy because it was being handled in another area, in another courthouse, in the same district, but by a completely different judge. So now this is foisted upon her. I don't blame her for taking what would be a safe-ish route by appointing a neutral third party to handle it and then just shove this Mishigas onto that uh, right. that special master. So Team Trump's lawyers have been getting some criticism in the press. I, I want to ask you, is it fair for being somewhat sloppy, especially when they made the request for the special master? Is that criticism fair? Yes, it is. Because when you're asking a federal judge for something, you have to be crystal clear what you're asking for. So much of federal practice is really not annoying a federal judge, believe it or not. I mean, they take every ruling very seriously. So when you submit a motion, like I believe Trump's lawyers did, that was a little disjointed. And by the way, had some okay case law in it. Had they organized it properly, made it clear the relief that they were asking for, then it might not have led to the judge saying, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, hey guys, File something else because I don't know what you I don't know what this is. Yeah. So that is something that you really want to avoid, especially in federal court. I know I've been yelled at by far yeah. too many federal judges that the FBI did take documents that were attorney client privilege. Does this hurt the DOJ's case in any way? Arguably, you could say that, well, maybe the FBI or DOJ should have been pushing for a special master from the outset. Right. Because, look, I'm biased. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've had privileged taint teams or filter teams uh, on cases that I'm involved in. And I'm just, I don't have a ton of uh, faith in them because after all, DOJ is essentially saying, hey, we need someone to look at this who will be neutral. Let's give it to some other DOJ lawyers. No, they all have the yeah. same mission, which is justice, but they all are prosecutors and people involved in the business of prosecution. So look, it's a fair criticism that a filter team is a filter team in name, but maybe not truly impartial. I got it. Danny Savalos, who I want to be on the record on this, always says interesting things. Danny, we appreciate it. All right. Also tonight, we want to turn to weather. We're tracking severe storms rolling through the Midwest. 11 million people under a severe thunderstorm watch. So many facing the possibility of flash flooding. One state already slammed by damaging floodwaters. Mississippi, of course. Residents there recovering this week after torrential rain caused the Pearl River to crest at about 35 feet. Our Guad Venegas is there in Jackson, Mississippi, live for us tonight. While we see some of those floodwaters there receding behind you, luckily for the residents of Mississippi, this flooding wasn't as catastrophic as the state saw in 2020. What happened here, though, because there were so many warnings over the weekend? Tom, well, the difference between this and what happened in 2020 are just a few inches. So over the weekend, officials declared that state of emergency preparing for a crest that could have gotten up to about 36 feet. What we saw in 2020 was about 36 and a few more inches. Uh, luckily, as you just reported, it was a little less than that. So the inches, that's a difference between the water reaching right up to the front steps of people's houses or inside of the houses. So fortunately, uh, the water levels began to drop today when it reached those uh, 35.4 feet. Uh, and that's good news. It hasn't rained today like it did last week and over the weekend. Uh, the forecast indicates it probably will not rain tomorrow. Very small possibility of rain. All good news for the people of Jackson, Mississippi, who were prepared for the worst. We have some communities like this one. You can see some vehicles were affected. Uh, the water in these streets making it unpassable for some of the residents. But all good news because the water did not reach the homes. So we did not see what many feared could have been 2020 once again, Tom. That, that, that is good news. But you mentioned the residents there. How are they living with this? They've had to deal with these floods over the past few days. There was the, the fear of a boil water order as well. How are residents holding up? Right, Tom. So there's this uh, other water crisis in Jackson that was initially not related to the rain, but now has gotten worse, according to the mayor. So they've had this uh, boil water notice in effect for weeks. I spoke to the mayor uh, today, and he says that the water services for people in Jackson is actually dealing with the issues they had from the infrastructure coming in from the weeks before, plus the flooding. So the flooding actually made it much more difficult. They had to drop the pressure for a lot of these homes, meaning a lot of the people aren't getting any pressure in their homes or they're not getting water at all. 
overall. And that boil water notice is still in effect here in Jackson, Mississippi, as they try to fix those issues. But they will have the challenges coming from the flooding because this flooding obviously is affecting these communities, but also the areas where the water reservoir is at, where these plants collect the water that eventually goes into the system. These are all the issues that officials will have to be dealing with uh, moving forward here in Jackson, Mississippi, Tom. Guad Venegas on the ground first there in Mississippi. Guad, we appreciate it. For more on the ongoing flood threat, I want to bring in NBC meteorologist Dylan Dreyer. Dylan, so talk to us more about the flooding, and thankfully the rain has stopped. The rain has stopped in Mississippi today, but more rain is likely tomorrow. And keep in mind that the rivers are what we're watching right now, and along the banks of those rivers where we're seeing flooding. So the Pearl River in Jackson, Mississippi, it did crest today, but it's very slow to recede. And while we will see a break from the heavy rainfall, we do have more heavy rain sitting back through Louisiana. So that's going to continue to move to the east. And keep in mind, the ground is totally saturated. So any little bit of rain or any brief downpour would cause, unfortunately, more flooding. Uh, to the north, though, is where we're really keeping an eye on for tonight. We had uh, wind reports in Chicago just under 60 miles per hour. Northern Indiana saw a wind report of 81 miles per hour. That was a, a strong enough wind to just rip some trees down at their bases. So very, very strong winds with these storms. But as soon as they move through, they're done. So when you deal with this storm through tonight. As soon as it passes by, you will see quick improvements. But we do still have the chance of some winds over 75 miles per hour. You see that includes Fort Wayne and northern uh, Indiana. We're also looking at the possibility of hail to be an inch or more in diameter. And we still can't rule out a tornado, although it seems to be the straight line winds that are causing most of the damage. It's just a cold front that's moving eastward. It's warm and humid ahead of it. It's cooler, drier behind it. You have that clash of air masses. And as we go into the overnight hours into early tomorrow morning, we'll see those storms wind down. And then they fire right back up as we get into the daytime heating on Tuesday. So more storms are likely, unfortunately, right along that I-95 corridor, right during rush hour tomorrow evening. Now, we're not, as of this moment, looking for that severe threat to spread across most of the Northeast. However, I do think tomorrow, once these storms start firing up, we might see uh, that increase a bit. So something to keep in mind for tomorrow afternoon and evening. As for rain, again, the Northeast does need the rain. We haven't had a lot. So one to perhaps two inches of rain could be a good thing, although when it falls at two to three inches per hour, it could lead to some brief flash flooding. But overall, the ground does need it, Tom. Okay, Dylan, for us tonight, Dylan, we appreciate that. Now to a violent weekend across the U.S., a gunman opening fire in an Oregon supermarket while police say people were gunned down at random in Detroit. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the very latest on the summer surge in gun violence. Tonight, investigators in Bend, Oregon, are trying to find out why a gunman opened fire at the supermarket Sunday night, killing two people and wounding two others. I heard what I'm guessing is six, seven shots going off. Authorities now say one of the victims, a store employee, heroically tried to disarm the gunman. And may very well have prevented further deaths. Nationwide, the headlines of this weekend's gun violence were grim. In a Phoenix shootout, three people dead, two officers wounded. In Houston, police say a man set an apartment building on fire and shot five residents, killing three of them. In Detroit, four people shot by a man police believe to have randomly targeted victims over two and a half hours. We don't see any uh, criminal history at this time, and we have some indication that there is mental illness. In D.C., Washington commanders running back Brian Robinson Jr. is hospitalized after being shot during a possible attempted carjacking. In New York, one man dead, four others wounded during a shooting at the iconic Coney Island boardwalk. And in Philadelphia, a four-year-old boy is recovering after being shot inside a barber shop. They're always right caught in a crossfire. Still, while shootings in some cities like Philadelphia, D.C., and Houston are up this year, Across the country, crime analysts say shootings overall are actually down slightly. These numbers are still very elevated from pre-pandemic numbers of 2019. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now live on set. Gabe, I also want to ask you about this horrifying incident that happened here in New York City at a bodega and an innocent bystander was run over. Yeah, that's right, Tom. It happened early Saturday morning. There were two women who brawled, essentially. The fight started inside the convenience store. If we put up that video there, we can see now outside it escalates. One of the women uh, gets inside her car, and actually they start throwing punches uh, at each other there, but one woman, woman gets inside her car and then jumps the curb, and you see that bystander right there, 59 years old. He's sitting on his walker. He's later pronounced dead at the hospital, Tom. 
extremely disturbing. Authorities are still looking for that woman, 27 years old. They okay. don't know where she is. And in my report, Tom, I mentioned that shootings were actually down in right. New York City and across the country. But crime analysts say that other types of crime, like assault, like yeah. that, are way up across okay. the country. Okay. Gabe Gutierrez, we appreciate that. Thank you for telling us. We take you overseas now to the devastating floods in Pakistan. More than 1,100 people now dead and millions displaced. The flooding so severe that authorities say a third of the country could be underwater by late September. NBC's Ali Aruzi has the shocking images. Tonight in Pakistan, a monster monsoon causing unprecedented devastation across the country. Since mid-June, the massive floods killing over 1,100 people and displacing millions, the Pakistani government says. The floods destroying bridges and roads, making rescue efforts difficult. This video showing a boy stranded on a rock amidst the raging waters, a soldier pulling him to safety, but others not as fortunate. This video showing a large building crumbling under the currents. Satellite images show the shocking before and after, Entire villages gone. Pakistan's climate change minister, Sheri Rahman, saying in an interview that she fears a third of the country could be underwater by late September. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif flying over the disaster zone on Sunday, saying it was the worst monsoon Pakistan had seen in three decades. In a tweet saying, the magnitude of the calamity is bigger than estimated. He's now pleading for international help. Homes, farmland, businesses crumbling into the rushing floods. More than 33 million people have been affected by the disaster, or about 15% of the population of the country, with over 500,000 forced to seek refuge in temporary camps. The food lines, endless. Rahman saying parts of the country resemble a small ocean. The international community is responding, with Turkey and the United Arab Emirates sending aid. While the rain stopped in the last few days, more is expected in September, as a massive country braces for the continued climate catastrophes. Ali Aruzi, NBC News, Tehran. And we have a team on the ground in Pakistan now headed to the area's hardest hit by that flooding. We will continue to update this story as it develops. Okay, back here at home now and to NASA, hoping to try and launch its Artemis 1 mission to the moon later this week after mechanical problems at the last minute forced the space agency to scrub the launch this morning. The goal is to eventually put the first woman and the first person of color on the moon by 2025. Tom Costello is at the Kennedy Space Center with more. Artemis uh, launch control. We are currently in an unplanned hold at T minus 40 minutes. The problems popped up early this morning with the 32 story tall Artemis on the pad, poised for liftoff. First, it was the threat of summer weather, then, a problem with engine number three sitting at the bottom of that super cooled orange fuel tank. The Artemis rocket uses four RS 25 engines that previously flew on space shuttle missions. Engine number three flew on six shuttle flights. The problem, liquid hydrogen fuel wasn't flowing properly and the engine could not get cold enough, a showstopper. Just two minutes into this morning's launch window, Mission Control canceled today's attempt. Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub for today. For the hundreds of thousands of spectators who'd lined bridges and packed nearby beaches to watch, NBC's Kerry Sanders found disappointment. No lunch today. Oh, my God, my God, my God. I will try to arrange my uh, schedule to go back here. But excitement for what's to come. It's still an adventure, and it's still going to be really cool. The next launch window comes Friday or Monday if engineers can diagnose and fix the engine trouble. We're going to play all nine innings here, you know, and, and we're not ready to give up yet. If NASA determines it needs to swap out the problem engine, it would likely have to move the entire rocket stack back to the vehicle assembly building. And that delay could take weeks. But for NASA chief Bill Nelson, who had four launches scrubbed when he flew as a space shuttle astronaut, the delay is simply part of the business. And so this is the history, the culture of NASA. You don't go until it's as safe as it can possibly be. Tonight, NASA is playing it safe. 
All right, Tom joins us from the Kennedy Space Center. Tom, you know, we're approaching Labor Day. When can we expect to get a decision on whether or not NASA will attempt a Friday launch? I think we're going to find out tomorrow. They're hoping to announce that by 6 p.m. tomorrow. It all depends on what the engineers find, right? Because right down here at the bottom where, this, where these engines are located, that's what they got to figure out. What is causing that one engine not to super cool? They can't lift off without that engine in compliance. If they can't, if they can't figure this out, then they're going to have to move this entire rocket stack over to the vehicle assembly building. We're talking about a week's long delay, likely. So all eyes are on Friday. If that doesn't work, it'll probably be Monday. Tom Costello for us tonight. Tom, we thank you for that. So Tom covers space. Our next guest lived in space. For a closer look at the significance of the Artemis launch and this big scrub today, let's bring in former NASA astronaut and professor of engineering at Columbia University, Mike Messamino. A fun fact about Mike now, his team holds the longest record for the most spacewalking time on a single space shuttle. Pretty cool. Also the first yeah. guy to tweet from space. That's right. Take that, Neil Armstrong. I don't know if that's an honor, but we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, I don't know either. we'll, we'll, we'll hold it as an honor. Uh, yeah. My first question to you is, I know no. you're not a meteorologist. Do you think no. this launch happens Friday? Uh, I, I think that if, if I, I don't, who knows, right? I think the right answer is we don't know because we start making predictions. We look silly. Uh, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if they make another attempt. And I think they're working toward that. I also wouldn't be surprised if they eventually stand down. But right now, I think they're using this when I, I saw the press conference earlier. And they're using this as an opportunity to, to work the exercise for everybody, for everybody in launch control, for everyone in mission control, for the closeout crew, for everyone down there. They're doing this time now. So this is really a test flight. So they're going to use these days as a chance to uh, get ready again, go through all the troubleshooting, and they are working toward a launch on Friday. On a serious note, we need this launch to happen so we can put another man on the moon or woman on the moon. Yeah, so if this is delayed again, what do mm -hmm. you think happens to the calendar? I mean, how far does this set us back? Uh, they have a, a calendar laid out. So if they can't go Friday, the next opportunity is Monday. And I was looking just, just earlier. Uh, I think the next time they have a block of days like that, that they can go on a long mission. So they want to go for six for six weeks for about 42 days. There are other windows where they can go like for a couple of, you know, four weeks or then there's days they can't go. But the next uh, group of days that, that shows up like we've had recently is at the end of September. But no one's going to I don't think anyone's going to remember that, even if they push it even further yeah. beyond that. What I've seen with my experience at NASA, the flights get delayed over and over again. The Hubble Space Telescope launched years late. The James Webb Telescope that we enjoyed yeah. the photos from uh, just a month ago, that was late. That was supposed to go years ago. People don't remember, or they, they maybe remember it got delayed, but if you have a catastrophe, they're certainly gonna remember that, so it's much better the way. This project is already billions over budget. It, yeah. it may be delayed yet again. Mm -hmm. We are in a space race with the Chinese right now. Do you think the Chinese get to the moon before we get there again? Uh, with people? Yeah. My prediction there is no. I think okay. we're a lot closer. Uh, we have a, a, a space vehicle built. We have a rocket ready to go. Uh, we have everything in place. We just have to wait for the right day to send them. So I know I think we're in really good shape. And I think we're going to get people on the moon. The next country will be the United States, but we're not going to be doing it alone. What we're doing with our international. So partners. we have we're, we're trying to chase down another mission to the moon. Mm -hmm. Put a space station there. The Chinese are trying to do the same thing. Yeah. How do you claim property on the moon? I don't know. That's an international. Uh, that's going to be an international issue. Is it whoever gets there first? I don't think so. I don't. I think uh, you know our flags are still there. By the way, we have yeah. six of them planted from the Apollo missions that landed. I think what's going to happen as far as the countries sharing this, which will be very interesting, Tom. It'll be similar, I think, to what we have going on in South uh, in, in Antarctica and the South Pole. And it's very similar in the exploration sense, is that about 100 years ago, people were trying to get there and they got there. And it was about 50 years later that they set up a research station that is shared by different countries. I think the same thing is going to be with the moon. 50 years ago is when we went just for visits. And now we have the technology and the wherewithal and the partnerships with both countries and industry to get back there to stay. And I think that the science part of it is going to be set up as an international research station. That's what I would suspect. I don't think you can actually claim you're going to say this is mine. I don't think that's going to happen. We're going to have to wait and see, but it, it could almost be a good problem to have because that means you have two countries who have that made it to be, the moon, yeah. who have put space stations there. That shows how far we've come. I, I agree. I think that How far away do you think are we from that? From getting people... Yeah, the, again, and putting I, the space station. Yeah, I think, well, I think the uh, certainly the way that the Artemis 
program has laid out. Those first three missions seem pretty solid. The hardware is built. It needs to be checked out. And if that's successful, which I think it will be eventually, uh, we're looking at about two years to send people around the moon again, similar to what they did with Apollo right. 8 if we're, for the historians. Um, I think that's going to happen in a couple of years. And it'll probably be, I think, about four years until we can land people there. 2030 to 2040, that, those 10 years could be momentous for the space programs I would the think, world. I would think, I certainly, I think yeah. so. We should definitely by that point, I think within the next four years, we should have boots on the moon again is what yeah. the, you know, the term is with the first woman, the first person of yeah. color and so on, getting in and exploring there for a few days at least, maybe a week or so. And then beyond that, it still kind of needs to be figured out. I think that's going to be a partnership between the U.S. and other countries but also with some of the in, uh, companies Private that have companies, gone involved. Yeah. I think they're going to be in it big time. I think by then we could set up this, this gateway that they're talking about, sort of this infrastructure between the Earth and the moon to study the moon, to set up uh, uh, economic benefits, uh, research, but also use it as a place to launch from so we can go further into the solar system, which means Mars. Still ahead tonight, the crash involving children on a highway in Ohio. Two school buses involved in a chain reaction collision. News on injuries still coming in. Plus, the smash and grab robbery caught on camera in L.A. The massive sum those thieves were able to get away with. And diving to the rescue, how one son's quick thinking saved his mom's life. You'll hear from her when we come back. Top story just getting started on this Monday night. All right, we're back now with a shocking string of crimes caught on camera here in New York City. The criminals riding mopeds as they rob their victims. Maya Eaglin with those videos and this story. Tonight, New York City police are searching for a group of men they say are responsible for a series of brazen daylight robberies on mopeds over the weekend. Separate incidents in different parts of the city involving the use of electric scooters to quickly approach victims, strike, and then speed away. On Friday, the first attack caught on a security camera released by police. A 64-year-old man walking in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan doesn't notice two men on mopeds approaching him from behind. One man gets off, allegedly grabs the $12,000 Rolex on the man's wrist, yanks it off and appears to push the man to the ground. The victim runs after them but can't keep up with the motorized scooters. The man suffered a few scrapes but refused medical attention. Then on Saturday, a nearly identical crime, also caught on video footage released by the NYPD. Two young women walking near the famous Guggenheim Museum on the Upper East Side, attacked by two men on a scooter. First, the driver appears to swipe for the woman's necklace, but she dodges to the ground. The passenger then goes in for a second try, but the victim's friend drags her away, allowing the woman to get in a few well-placed kicks. The would-be thieves quickly roll out without taking anything. The woman suffered only minor injuries. NYC Mayor Eric Adams addressed the vehicles used in crimes at a press conference today. Motorcycles, ATVs, uh, creating havoc in our system in our city. We saw how they use in criminal behavior. We're zeroing in on those types of vehicles and those who are using these tools. So our holistic approach, yes, it was successful in decreasing shootings, decreasing homicides, but we have so much more to do around those serious uh, predatory crimes like burglary and robbery. But there's no conversation about how are we going to implement the rules that are on the books to stop these vehicles from hurting people. Law enforcement expert Manny Gomez says such crimes are difficult to prevent and hard to punish. They trace back that motor vehicle back to the perpetrator. They identify him or them, they arrest them, and they're out the next day. It all comes as major crime in New York City has risen significantly since last year. Robbery, assault, burglary, grand larceny and car theft all seeing major increases. Only murder has fallen since this date in 2021. Too, right? All right. Maya Eaglin joins us now live in studio. Maya, I was just asking you, I mean, I mean, these thieves, it's hard to find them because they're wearing helmets and they're wearing masks. On top of that, their bikes don't have plates, so they're not really traceable. And authorities are asking for public tips and to call the Crime Stoppers line to help with that information. And this happens at a time when New York City is just becoming overrun with motorized bicycles and scooters and everything else uh, that, that appears to be like a motorcycle. Some of the victims fought back. What, what, do, what do experts say? So the person we talked today said that might not be the best idea 
their advice is to throw your items, your valuables away from you right. and just make yourself not an easy target. Stay away from dark places and don't be alone if you can avoid it. Yeah, but even that first one we showed was in daylight. That right. was wild. Okay, Maya, we thank you for that. Now to another incredible moment caught on camera, a 10-year-old boy saving his mother's life after she suffered a seizure while in their pool. NBC's Priscilla Thompson spoke to that mother and has this story. A harrowing rescue caught on camera. An Oklahoma boy jumping into action after his mother began having a seizure in the pool. 10-year-old Gavin Keeney seen here swimming with his mom in tow for nearly a minute, keeping her head above water as she continues to seize. I heard was like a lot of splashing and moving around. I heard like kind of yelling but also like drowning. So then I looked and then I saw her like seizing and then I went and I jumped in and I got her back to the ladder. Gavin then struggling to get up the ladder before his grandfather rushes in to help. Mom Lori Keeney has epilepsy and Gavin often helps her through seizures, sometimes daily. What goes through your mind when you watch that video? It was heartbreaking and just to see him pull me to the ladder and hold on to with all of his little might to keep my head above water. There's a lot of pride there, but there's also a lot of um, mom guilt emotions going on as well. On this day, she says Gavin had just gotten out of the pool minutes earlier and was drying off on the porch when things took a turn. I don't remember any of that moment until I came to and I was in the water and it absolutely it terrified me. Lori captured the death defying rescue on her security camera and shared it on Facebook earlier this month. Her post has garnered hundreds of likes and comments, all hailing Gavin a hero. You are raising an amazing young man, one user writes. Another commenting, Gavin is a true hero. You taught him well. His courageous actions also catching the attention of the local police department. Last week, they presented Gavin with an award for saving a life in front of all his classmates. Do you think your son saved your life? I absolutely do think my son saved my life. And if I had been swimming alone, I would have drowned. That possibility apparent in the video. Lori jumping into her father's arms and holding on tight as she regained consciousness. Gavin watching from a distance before joining in their embrace. I want him to continue this compassion that he has for people that do have disabilities, to try to continue to show love and light and positivity, especially in a world when we really, really need that. What a great kid. Priscilla Thompson joins us now from Houston. Priscilla, I have to ask you, how's Gavin doing after all of this? Yeah, Gavin's mom says that he was a little freaked out by what happened, but as soon as she he knew that she was okay, he was totally fine, back to his normal 10-year-old self, ran inside the house to play uh, Fortnite. He's been a little overwhelmed by all of the attention that he's getting, but she says that he loves it. And an interesting fact here, Tom, this is actually Gavin's second time saving his mom's life. He also helped her once when she was choking. Tom? What a brave young, I should say young man, what a brave little boy. All right, Priscilla, we thank you so much for that one. That was a great story. Still ahead, the stun gun lawsuit, the massive payout, $100 million massive. What Atlanta man is getting after a 2018 police chase left him paralyzed. That's next. All right, time now for Top Stories Newsfeed. We begin with the crash involving two school buses in Ohio. The two buses were involved in a chain reaction crash involving several other vehicles on Interstate 70. It happened near the state's border with Pennsylvania. Officials say several children were taken to local hospitals. No word yet on their conditions. The cause is now under investigation. All right, in California, police searching for three suspects behind a smash and grab robbery caught on camera. Take a look. New surveillance video shows the trio using sledgehammers to break display cases at the store near LA. The group stuffing bags with merchandise, employees throwing objects at the group to try and get them to leave. The store says the suspects made off with about $200,000 worth of merchandise. A federal jury in Atlanta has awarded a, a person $100 million after he was left paralyzed during a 2018 foot chase with police. 
The 69-year-old who was panhandling at the time fell and broke his neck after a police officer shocked him with a stun gun. His lawyer says he now needs round-the-clock care after the incident left him paralyzed from the waist down. And in New York State, you will now need an ID to buy cans of whipped cream. Stores have begun enforcing a new law which prohibits people under 21 from purchasing the products. Officials say the cans are filled with nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas, and were being dangerously used by minors. The law quietly took effect in November. It is now getting enforced across the state. Okay, switching gears now, and we move on to the war in Ukraine. Tonight, UN inspectors are traveling to a nuclear plant that sparked fears of a radiation disaster after it was briefly knocked offline. This as Ukraine has reportedly launched a counteroffensive against Russia. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald is on the ground there tonight. Tonight, an urgent mission to prevent a potential nuclear disaster. Ukraine's foreign ministry says a team of scientists from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the world's nuclear watchdog, is heading to Ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant, which is currently under Russian control. The team setting off today and could arrive as early as Wednesday. The agency says the team will undertake urgent safeguard activities and will determine if the plant is able to operate safely. But their mission has limits. They can only work within the mandate of the IAEA, which is limited. It's not an independent organization. It's an intergovernmental organization. And Russia is part of it. The emergency visit comes with intense fighting around the plant. New satellite images show multiple holes in the roof of the plant, both sides blaming each other for the crisis. Over the weekend, Russia's defense ministry accusing Ukraine of shelling a facility that stores nuclear fuel. Meanwhile tonight, reports of a Ukrainian counteroffensive in Russian-occupied Kherson. Pro-Russian officials say Ukraine is taking heavy losses and deny any counteroffensive. Kherson was the first city the Russians seized in the beginning of their invasion. A Ukrainian military official didn't confirm the counteroffensive to NBC News, but does say that they pushed the Russians back from key positions. Tom? Dinosaur skeleton found in a Portuguese man's backyard could be the largest ever found in Europe. Take a look. Paleontologists say the unearthed spine and ribs, that's what you're looking at there, suggest the dinosaur was about 39 feet tall and 82 feet long. It likely roamed the earth 150 million years ago. The skeleton was excavated this month, five years after a man found fossilized bone fragments while doing work on his house. Out of the Americas and a look at the changing Catholic Church, Pope Francis, the first pope from the Americas, expanding the ranks of cardinals who will vote for his successor and shape church doctrine, appointing new cardinals from underrepresented Catholic populations in South America, Asia, and Africa. NBC San Diego's Melissa Adan has the report from the Vatican. Inside St. Peter's Basilica. An old world institution elevating a new class of cardinals over the weekend. Il foco deve portarlo nel mondo. Pope Francis cementing his legacy with a mix of faces, not just from Europe, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. From all these different parts of the world, but we have a great commonality, both in our faith and in the pastoral challenges we tend to face. 20 in total, four of them from Latin America, including Adalberto Martinez Flores, the first cardinal from Paraguay, and Archbishop Leonardo Ulrich Steiner from Manaus, the first cardinal to represent Brazil's Amazon region. La violenza ha cresciuto tantissimo nella nostra regione, non soltanto verso la ecologia, ma anche la questione della droga anche. In 2013, the Argentinian-born Francis was elected the head of the Catholic Church, becoming the first pope from the Americas. Since 2013, Francis has elevated 83 of the 132 cardinals who are young enough to join a conclave and will vote to elect the next pope. These new cardinals already are helping Pope Francis shape the future of a more global Catholic Church. A time when many, both in the U.S. and across Latin America, are leaving the church. A recent study in Latin America showing a drastic 20 percent drop among those who identify as Catholic. All of the world's cardinals are gathered here inside the Vatican discussing the new Vatican Constitution with Pope Francis. They're also speaking about topics of inclusion, like including women as deacons. This despite conservative voices in the church. This meeting of cardinals comes amid concerns about the 85-year-old pope's health. 
Earlier this summer, the pontiff acknowledging he can no longer travel like he used to, opening the door to the possibility of him stepping aside. La possibilità di farmi da parte, no? Questo con tutta onestà, no? But despite the health concerns, Francis's legacy is already stamped by his leadership choices. A key selection this weekend is Robert McElroy from San Diego. The fact that Pope Francis uh, elected him to be a cardinal means a great deal. Um, it's, it's kind of a more inclusive approach for the church, um, pro-environment and um, helping really every sector of society. Cardinal McElroy has been vocal about the church's involvement on immigration issues and is one of just a few U.S. Catholic leaders who signed a statement last year denouncing bullying against LGBTQ youth. His views often in contrast to some of the other cardinals. Well, there are differences of culture, but there are many commonalities of challenge. I find when I go to different parts of the world uh, and, and encounter uh, members of the church, leaders in the church, they're very welcoming because we have that common bond. For many Catholic faithful around the world, this diverse group of cardinals represents the future of the faith. Melissa Adon, NBC News, the Vatican. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.